But this this is strangely more disconnected than doing this to students at uh, remote lectures, which is a bit odd. Uh, I suppose if anyone's got any questions during during the talk, uh, if you want to just put them in the chat here, because I'll, I'll keep it open. Otherwise, I'll, I'll put up time for questions at the end. Uh, but otherwise, I'll just get to it. So, uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, it's like a, a decent number of people there. Uh, I, I think the last time I did yeah, this was, was actually in, in person. That's, that's a chair. Uh, not this talk, actually. So, the talk is on Francis' considerations for the high efficiency image style format. I'll talk about what that actually is in a second. So I'm hoping some people at least will have heard of what this is, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of go through it in a little bit of detail. Uh, but I'm, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm uh, Sean McKeown, I'm a lecturer at Edinburgh Napier University, so obviously been doing this sort of Zoom uh, online stuff for a couple of years now, so this isn't a uh, particularly new experience for me. But if you want to get in touch, I'll have my Twitter and email down at the bottom for the whole talk, so you don't have to... Uh, you know, pay, pay much attention to that just now and be on the slides as we go forward. So uh, I should probably mention that this is uh, taken from a source paper. So I, this is actually just a modified version of the talk that I gave at this conference, uh, roughly the start of the pandemic, give or take. So it's, it's really available, the paper's really available. You can either Google the title of this talk or the paper as is there, and you'll find an archive link or the PDF on Napier PC UK. And if, if you can't find either of those, just feel free to email me, I can send you a copy. Because uh, the whole point of this is that we want to disseminate this information, make sure everyone's able to, to get to it. So uh, if you guys are serving up the slides afterwards, I can send those through as well. Right, so why am I talking about Heath? And that's how they like to have it pronounced. So it can also end in a C for Heek, which doesn't sound quite as nice to me, but let's, let's go with Heath for now. So as you're probably aware, JPEG is old. You might not be aware of how old it is. Uh, 1992 is when the, the standard by Wallace, uh, the original paper, was actually produced. So it's uh, it's very long in the tooth, especially for the sort of internet era. So in 1992, yeah, things were low resolution and GeoCities was a thing and everything looked awful. And JPEG has done quite well to age as well as it has, I think. But fundamentally, it's lacking support for modern things. So HDR, might have been a thing in the movies, potentially. It wasn't, an image, it wasn't a thing for image file formats back then. So HDR wasn't really considered. And it's not really something that's been bolted on to JPEG since either. Uh, we've also we're only looked at the 8-bit color depth. So we've not got you know, all the colors of the rainbow, as it were. Things like transparency, you probably realize that if you've ever tried to make a transparent image, you have to set the things to PNG. And the same thing for animation. JPEG doesn't do that. You need things like APNG or GIF or GIF, depending on which of the, the sites you're on with how to pronounce that. But one thing you probably have noticed if you've been around on the internet since the 90s is that JPEG looks awful, particularly low resolutions, just blocky messes once you actually zoom in. So when you compare it to the more modern formats, it doesn't really hold up very well, either in terms of compression uh, reduction of size, or in terms of the artifacts, or in terms of the features like we just talked about there. And it's no surprise there's actually been a bunch of opportunities, let's say, to, to get rid of, of JPEG. And uh, only eight years after JPEG was released, JPEG 2000, that says JPEG, JPEG it's meant to be JPEG, uh, JPEG 2000 was a thing, and it never really took off. So it's objectively better in every way than JPEG from 1992, but it just never went anywhere. The support never really gained enough traction to replace JPEG properly. And we've seen this time and time again, things like BPG, which I think stands for Better Portable Graphics, which is a similar kind of name to PNG, actually. WebP, which is Google's format, which you've probably seen. In fact, the background that I downloaded for this talk was WebP when I got it off the internet. So that definitely is in use somewhere, just not very often. And you've probably not heard of JPEG XT and a bunch of the other JPEG uh, formats that tried to replace JPEG or they're trying to develop standards that will replace it just now. And AVIF. But one of the common themes for the latter ones is that they're typically using the uh, codecs that are meant for video, and video actually encodes still, still images effectively as keyframes. So because video technology has actually moved on quite a lot, even though our, our still image standards haven't, then we just kind of borrow those video still image compression elements 
and that's actually what Heath does. So Heath uh, was actually, he's been around since 2015. You know, that's quite a long time, you know, that's seven years. And it's got the file extension Heath or Heek, so H-E-I-F or C at the end. And it tries to bring in all of these improvements that we've seen. So if we look at in terms of the compression ratio, it's up to 50%. In practice, I haven't actually seen that. Uh, and a test, as you can see on the right-hand side, I took a PNG image of a reasonable resolution, which was about 5 megabytes, and I converted it to JPEG. And, Heath. and you'll see that the heat version definitely is smaller, but not, not by a huge amount. It's not going to be dramatic in every case, but it does have all the support for all the HDR stuff that we're talking about. And it's allegedly got fewer artifacts, and it's better quality. There was a lot of arguing about that when uh, Apple decided to release that as part of their, their uh, iOS 11. So from iPhone 7 and whichever the same era iPad was on iOS 11, around right about 2017, Apple switched to Heath as their default for camera-based images at least. So you're taking that software, taking a picture, it's saved in Heath. And for the iPhone users, you've probably experienced some grief because of that, like we'll get to in a second. But that transition was really the first major step in getting rid of JPEG, in my opinion. It's the first time we've seen something that's really had adoption, market adoption. And there was a lot of fighting over you know, whether it's actually better or not to look at. But one of the benefits is, because it's using these video codecs, it's actually using H.265 or HEDC uh, to, to encode the images and the burst shots, which we'll get to. Uh, we can actually like, use hardware acceleration, so it's, it's just better in terms of being more modern in a lot of different ways. So the problem really is the software support. So it's, it's improving, and since I wrote the paper in 2020, or since it was published in 2020, I can imagine things have got a bit better, but I keep checking, and it doesn't seem to be getting better at the rate you might expect, especially given that Apple has taken it on as a sort of large-scale adoption. So quite often, the advice has been to export to JPEG if you want to send it to other devices. So you've probably seen, if you're an iPhone user, you've probably seen articles like this, where it's saying, oh, uh, just, just export it to JPEG, or here's how you export it to JPEG as part of iOS 11 or 12 or 13, whatever it is. And this article I'm, I'm screenshot here is, is actually from 2020, so three years after Apple adopted it, this was still a thing. And it probably still is. I'm not an iPhone user myself. So, unfortunately, this same advice I found in quite a lot of forensics blogs. Now, I don't want to name them because that's not really the point. But even the forensics tooling, the forensics and, uh, blogs and, and companies that are doing this for a living didn't really have much of a better solution at the time, which is really what inspired me to write the paper. So, I noticed that there's just not generally a good understanding of the format. This includes forensic circles, and anyone that's done any forensics will know that knowing how things are constructed is actually half the battle. You know, if you want to do browser forensics, then you probably want to either have a good tool for it or be able to go through SQLite databases. Same thing with mobile forensics. If the tool doesn't support it, then fundamentally you're looking at SQLite databases or XML files. You know, it pays to understand how these things are structured. So most of the papers were on compression in media formats and features, so it's more to do with the encoding rather than how does this work in terms of forensic artifacts. So I thought, I, I want to remedy that. And there were some forensics blog posts, in fact, one of the ones I, I referenced in the paper is uh, Cheeky Monkey 4N6, which, as you're calling was, was forensics. And uh, yeah, genuinely published a conference paper with a reference to Cheeky Monkey Forensics' blog, which I thought was a, a new career high. But yeah, it's, uh, it's actually not a bad post, so and it, it's quite funny, monkey, MS Paint drawings, so yeah, go look, it's good stuff. So, the investigation of the paper is basically saying, this is all bad news, we need to do better than this as a, as a forensics community. So, again, why do we care about this? Well, if that wasn't convincing enough, well, we just have to look at the market share that Apple actually has for iOS devices. So, worldwide, we're sitting at about, you know, a, a sort of, Three, three quarters Android, although it's, that's been diminishing every year since I started keeping track of this. And iOS is a bit more than a quarter. But if you look specifically at the sort of main uh, English speaking markets in the USA and the UK, it's actually a bit more like 50 50. So I, I probably should have checked this when I wrote the paper because I, I said basically you're doing 
mobile forensics, about 20% of the investigations at the time would have been iOS. But in fact, if you're doing it in Britain or the USA, it's far more than that. It's more than double that. So we definitely have to know how these things work. And one of the problems is really that we've moved away from the still image format just being about a single image. So this is one of the things you might not realize, but the key format is it's actually a container where we can put multiple images inside. So the, as I said, it takes the codec from video encoding, but actually it borrows more than that. It's borrowing the structure of a video format, a video file format to be specific. So if we look at all the way back to the QuickTime, QuickTime movie format, everything is sort of derived from that. All the sort of MP4, MKV containers, they're all just that, they're containers, because if you think about, and this is maybe showing my age a bit, if you think about like a DVD menu, right? You've got all these different tracks, you've got different chapters for the film, you've got the extras, you've got different audio and language settings, you've even got the one where they, they have the, the commentary on top, right? It's all effectively different channels for the same related content. So video formats have had to deal with that for quite a long time, but now we're getting to the point where images are not just a single picture anymore. So you can think of a containerized image format as basically a, gal a gallery in a file. So we're not just storing a single image and a thumbnail like we would in JPEG, we're storing a sequence of images or a series of related images that we can then do stuff with. And the trick here is that when you're displaying that, we're typically only displaying the cover image of like. So that's like the, the book cover. You know, there's, there's loads of pages inside that might be more images inside, but we only really see the cover. That's the main thing that you want to display, and it's, it's tagged as the, the primary image of youth. So there are actually multiple what we call master images, so like source images if you like, and there's also potentially a bunch of derived images, which are actually, as the name suggests, derived from one or more master images. And we could have multiple sequences. So if you think about sort of live images you can take on phones these days, or the burst sequences, you hold them, the camera, uh, snapshot button, right? Take a burst and move it around. That's a sequence. And that has a specific encoding we have to take care of in this kind of format as well. But we've got more than that as well. So if you think about traditional image friends, then we look at things like exit data, or maybe we've got thumbnails embedded. And the thing is, for every one of these master images that's embedded in Keith, they can have separate exit content, or they can have individual thumbnails. So we've actually got not just a couple of images, but we've got a bunch of attached information to those images. And as we'll see, the support for that and actually dealing and working with that is not good at all. So most applications don't see more than that, just that cover image, that book cover, if you like. And that includes the conversion utilities. So all this advice saying convert it to JPEG and then do your analysis there, well, all you're really doing is converting that cover image, that what you want to be displayed and nothing else. You lose the rest of that content and that information. In fact, let me just go back to this a second. So what we're seeing on the right hand side here is, in fact, can I I'll turn on the pointer? Is that maybe more helpful? So hopefully you can see the laser pointer in the capture. Uh, let me know if not. So we've got the Mac preview application being displayed here. And basically we've got an image or a heath container, if you like, that's got one, two, three, four separate images, all of the different seasons, allegedly. And then we've got a fifth image, which actually combines them all together into a grid format. So the thing we're seeing displayed in the main pane here is that grid combination of the four master images. So if I was displaying that in most applications, I would only see this support grid here. I wouldn't actually really get access to the individual images that are comprising that grid itself. So that's, you know, you might not think that's a big deal right now, but not having access to those individual images might be a problem if we're trying to do proper analysis. And if you take that a bit further, then one of the things is you can actually tile images together. So not just in that sort of grid, combine them together to a big collage, if you like. Uh, Apple actually makes use of this just to store their images normally. So I tested this out. I had a friend who's had like an iPhone, whatever, maximum plus, you know, one of these like gold, I think it literally was a gold phone. Uh, not that he wanted the gold version specifically, it was the only one I could get. And uh, he sent me some images over and I had a look at it. And basically what is happening is they're taking 512 pixel blocks and they're combining them together into a big grid. Five minute warning code here. And that grid is what is actually displayed. 
So there's tens of sub images depending on the resolution. That depends on the, the phone we're taking with. So derived images are really important because they're actually, you know, quite strongly linked. I should have checked the time before I go home. Uh, they're quite strongly linked to the, uh, you know, the very nature of the whole thing. So on the right-hand side, you can see there's other forms. We've got alpha blends. So you can take two master images, blend them together into this like, sort of nice combination of the two. But we need to figure out how to display that, how to render that, how to deal with that. So derived images are combining things together, and you can do that in a bunch of different ways. But the fundamental thing is you need a mechanism to do that. So for the, the blending, for example, there's actually a third component we're missing here, which is the alpha mask. So how do I know which pixels to blend from each image? Well, I just have a bitmap that tells me with ones or zeros or something in between how much of each of the ones to show. So that's actually a third hidden image of the alpha mask. And we can do the same thing with depth of field. So we've got a depth mask which we can apply, which is actually more likely what you're going to see with um, Apple. So you know, you've got that sort of portrait mode where you take the, the depth of field image. So these auxiliary images aren't even displayed in any of the tools that I've used. So Mac Preview doesn't show them, they're not really viewable. You can't see them. But the problem is that could be used to encode other information, right? So if I've just got an alpha mask, that could actually be just a different image. That could just be a bit of image. And if I really wanted to, I could have three of those and I could have them represent different RGB channels and I could combine them later on into a full image. But we wouldn't really be able to notice it without proper analysis tools. Can run over great things. Right, so this, this gives us a bit of abuse potential because we can now use these auxiliary images which we can't actually really display properly at the moment as a carrier. So if we think about it in terms of steganography or just any kind of data hiding coding, this is now this sort of grayscale luminance channel that never really gets displayed anywhere. And if we're subtle about it, you wouldn't even be able to notice it even if we were using that in an alpha blend or a depth of field blend. So it just gives us additional channels that are not really up for analysis in the same way we really hope to all of image forensics. So what does it look like on Windows? I've showed you a couple of previews of what it looks like on Mac. Windows typically looks like this. You try and open the image, and uh, yeah, it just says we can. The Photos application in particular has a lot of trouble with this. However, you might see that it is rendering the thumbnail view in Explorer. So the grid version on the left-hand side of this, this book here, that is displaying, that's rendering okay, but the overlay, which is just a different combination, it's a, it's a different setup for deriving a derived image, doesn't display at all, right? So on Windows, it's, it's kind of tricky, there's a bunch of plugins you have to have, some of them are paid, it's just a bit of a mess, right? So even though Windows does support this, it doesn't support this out of the box, right? It's still a bit of a mess, even two years after writing that original paper. Uh, Android does support it, but again, it doesn't really have that full support we hope. So one of the other things we can do here as well is have lossless editing. So you take the original image and you chop off some bits, and normally what happens is, once you've made that edit, you don't get access to the original data, it's gone, right? But if, it, all it does is it, it gives you a different aperture for viewing that image, so the rest of that data is still present in the file, it's just not presented. So what actually happens is with the modifications of teeth, you can do them in real time at display time, and the player, players that the technical name they use in the documentation, is the thing that does that cropping. And this applies to rotate, mirror, and crop, which are what we call lossless edits, where the original image is still there, you just might not be able to see it, because again, our tooling isn't quite there. And a requirement of a complete heath player is that you can do all these things losslessly. So it's not so much a problem right now, but you can imagine situations where like, the illegal part of the image is cropped out. And if you don't have the tools to see that, that's a bit of a problem. However, last time I checked, Apple isn't supporting the, the lossless editing bit so much, but you can use it, you can generate these using APIs at the moment. So in the future, the cover image might not really be representative for Apple devices either, but you can still generate these images, uh, and there's a GitHub link in the paper you can generate these images using the APIs that I mentioned in that paper. And if you just look, this is one I just looked at uh, just earlier today before the talk. If you look at it in GIMP, it still doesn't let you see the rest of the image. You're still only seeing that cropped segment of it. So even a tool that has decent support for Heath doesn't give you the full image, it only gives you that cropped segment that the player is representing. So the rest of that image is still there in the file, I just can't see it. 
And to make matters worse, we can hide things. So I'll, I'll increase speed a little bit just to get through this. But basically, just as the auxiliary images, those bitmaps, those depth maps, uh, aren't visible by default, we can actually flag things to be hidden specifically. So if we look on the right hand side, this is actually a burst shot, there's a few preview images, and I flipped one bit that basically told the player not to display one of those. And uh, let's just skip through this. So a single bit in the in the information box basically just said don't display this. None of the players actually get around that. They all just do what that bit says. So the lack of frenzy skills is a big deal here because I can hide all the illegal stuff and just display the benign things and not be any of the wiser because the tooling isn't there. And oddly, he can actually refer to files outside as well. It's like a URL or URM uh, data field, which I think is supposedly for EXIF. You can see how pointing at external data could have security issues, but also just be a bit of a pain to analyze generally. There's no support, as far as I can see, for any of this stuff. And the only way to get all of the information for burst shots that I found is to use FFmpeg and export, and that gives you just a list of all the keyframes, as it were. So how does this apply for hashing? Well, hashing is an issue because cryptographic hashing is meant for identifying illegal content that's usually meant for identifying exact things. So there's a bunch of semantic things and approximate matching, which I talked about in my lectures, but we don't really want to get into that. But if it's looking for exact things, we've got a container, well, that's fine if we've only got one image and one thumbnail. But if you've got a container like format like Keith, that's about like zip, uh, hashing a zip file. You know, we don't you can move around things in that zip file. We can add things to the zip file. You can change the order of things. So hashing the whole thing isn't necessarily that useful unless we just want to identify that whole container. We're not identifying individual elements of that point. So I flip things around, I add new items, that hash breaks. And we also have to bear in mind that for burst shots, the images are encoded like videos. They're encoded differences effectively between the frames. So if you add in an extra frame or remove some frames, then we're going to again change the whole binary sequence, which is a problem for hashing things. So ideally, we need to do something a bit more clever, maybe involving hashing all the subframes. So we use that to export individual keyframes and hash those. So I'll go through the, the layout just uh, really briefly. In fact, I'll skip over this. If you want to know more about this, look at the have a look at the paper. But basically, because it's a complicated format, it's kind of all in place, right? Uh, you've got a lot of different ways of encoding this information, a lot of different combinations, and basically there's nothing that's going to look at all of these different boxes, right? There's tons of stuff in there that's a lot more complicated than JPEG is. Uh, I'll skip over this as well, but basically the point of this is for software support, it's just not there. So if you look at this, and again, this is in the paper, I don't really want to cover this, I was just going to, to show you that GIMP is pretty good support for still images, not for the burst shots. FFmpeg doesn't really do still images, but it does quite well at first shots, but all of the other things I looked at really hit and miss. You know, a lot of them don't really cover even the master images within, and they just don't handle burst sequences at all. So you really need to pick your battles here when using the tooling. So given all of the sort of lack of support I found, basically the, the, the analysis approach I'm suggesting is, have a look at the header. If you see anything that looks like this, it's a heat file, actually just says like um, F type heat or MIF1 heat, right? So you can just read that out. And then we see the picture part and that tells us it's actually still image, just a picture. We want to check for the box structure, which you can just do by looking at strings. And the main reason there is we want to see if there's any derived images. So if we just jump back really quickly, we can see here that that says grid, right? And that means that there's a grid and you can see there's a bunch of individual boxes with the individual master images. So that tells us how many pictures are actually in that image, even if you can't see them all or tools. And then we want to check, there's a specific bit, again, you can check in the paper, there's a specific bit that marks things as hidden, so we want to unhide those, which is flipping that bit. And then we can preview it in Mac or GIMP, and if it's a video we want to export using FFM. And that gives us, at least for now, the best shot at seeing everything inside that container, because really the tooling just still isn't there. So uh, conclusions, it's a complicated container format. It's not really a still image format in the, in the old sense for PNG or, or JPEG. Current forensics tools, not good. You actually have to do quite a lot of manual work if you really want to find out what's inside these files. And future forensics tools should really 
display the box structure and the item structure. Because remember, it can be a complicated arrangement of thumbnails and exit data. You want to be able to completely unpack that. You want to be able to display the hidden items, and that includes the auxiliary, depth map, things, sequences of frames, and all that exit data. You want to be able to hash the individual elements, which you get, uh, because it's a container format. There's no point hashing the whole zip file, we want to see what's inside of it. And we want to attempt to address things like external references and some of the other weird behavior that's in there. So if you want to know more, there's the specifications and the ISO documents, ISO BMF and ISO Heath. Uh, they're pretty awful reads, if I'm honest, which is why I wrote this paper. But the full paper, like I said, is, is easily available online. So uh, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up there. I know that the, the time has pushed a little bit. So uh, I don't know if we'll get time for questions or not. But if you want to ask me a question, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. So uh, that's the middle one there. And my email address is at the bottom if you're, if you're interested in following up a bit on that. Does anyone have any questions? So I don't know if we've got time for any questions, or should we just wrap up? Two seconds. Can you add a question? Okay. Do you want to come type it? <laughs> well, I should probably point out, there's a couple of APIs, and the, the best read overall is this, uh, I think it was a master's paper, a master's thesis, actually, uh, the Roman implementation for the format. And uh, it's just it's a really useful document for working through this. And Apple also have a bunch of videos on stuff, which is quite useful for the developers. Usually, the, the 2017 uh, WWDC is the best one, but I think they've made a few since. The difficult is it the white metadata on these files? Well, that assumes that we've got tools that can actually parse the format and allow you to edit that stuff. So the editors for it were few and far between. Uh, most of the stuff, including GIMP, was really working with a limited set. In fact, I didn't even see a good way of viewing the XF data, let alone editing it. Now, obviously, you can just get a, get a hex editor, and you can find the XF blocks, and you can do whatever you like with that. But in terms of having tooling to do it, or even viewing it, it's not really there. So if you take XF tool, and you point it at a Heath image that has four images in it, and they all have XF, you will see precisely one of those. You'll see whichever one is marked as the cover. So the whole thing is just a bit all over the place. Like if you edit it, people probably won't even notice because they won't see it. If that makes sense. 